Um, I do have some prepared words today. I know normally I wing it, but we have such an exciting uh, uh, opportunity today and um, so many special guests with us. And I wanted to really um, do it upright. So be patient with me. There, there are a lot of pages. No, I'm <laughs> um, welcome to Fan Memorial Library and to our celebration today. We are so grateful to be honoring Dr. Martha Swain here. With, with the inaugural Martha Swain Southern Women's History Speaker Series and grateful for the funding to support the series. We would also like to congratulate the University Press of Mississippi on their 50th anniversary and thank them for their contributions to today's event. They are right outside and desperate for you to pick up swag. <laughs> so please, please uh, visit them on the way out. Um, Dr. Martha Swain and her sister Margaret Swain have been staunch supporters of this library and of the university where their sister graduated through the Mary Elizabeth Swain Bacon Scholarship, as well as the generous donation of Dr. Swain's working collection on Southern women's history, which makes up the core of our growing Southern women's studies monograph collection. Their advice and encouragement, which is wonderful if you have an opportunity to get advice or encouragement from the Swain sisters, I highly recommend it. It's been invaluable um, as the Fant Library's Eula Culbertson Archives and Special Collections has centered research on the study of all aspects of Mississippi women's diverse history, created a database and to search archival materials on Mississippi women's archives, and now we establish the speaker series. Dr. Swain has long been a preeminent historian of Southern women's history and political history. She was a co-editor of the seminal two-volume Mississippi Women, Their History, Their Lives, Their History is Their Lives, along with several works related to the New Deal. A graduate of Mississippi State University, Dr. Swain earned her master's and PhD from Vanderbilt as a professor emeritus at both Texas Women's University and Mississippi State University. She has had an illustrious career as an academic, including receiving the Distinguished Senior Faculty Award at Texas Women's University and the Eudora Welty Book Prize at Mississippi University for Women, many others. In her service to the profession, she has been president of the Mississippi Historical Society and a member of the review boards of the Journal of Mississippi History and the Journal of Southern History. Still publishing her field, she astonishes me I am so proud to have this new series in her honor at this university and in this library. We are honored to have Dr. Martha Swain with here with us here today as a part of this celebration. Thank you. Thank you. There's more in the program. I did not read every single little bit of it. In her spirit of recognizing that, that a diversity of voices and perspectives are essential to understanding Southern women's history and Mississippi women's history in particular, we are hoping to use this series to broadly address the history of women in the South. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Ebony Lumumba, Chair of English at Tougaloo College, to shed light on this history from her lens as a Eudora Welty Scholar, in particular in light of her new chapter in the new essays on Eudora Welty, Class and Race where she explores social justice and race in relation to Welty's work. Dr. Lumumba is a graduate of Spelman College with a master's in English from Georgia State University and a PhD in English literature from the University of Mississippi. She was named the 2013 Eudora Welty Research Fellow by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History and the Eudora Welty Foundation. She has also been named uh, the Tugula Humanities Teacher of the Year by the Mississippi Humanities Council in 2014. She spe specializes in post-colonial literatures of the global South and representational equity in film culture. Her works include Caught in the Act of Living, Welty as Voyeur and Witness of Black Life, The Matter of Black Lives in American Literature, Eudora Welty's Nonfiction and Photography, and Demonstration of Life, Signifying for, Eudora, for Social Justice and Eudora Welty's The Demonstrators. She serves as a board member for the Foundation for Mississippi History, the Mississippi Humanities Council, and the Eudora Welty Foundation, among many others. She is also the founder of Mothers Obtaining Justice and Opportunities, a nonprofit supporting mothers pursuing undergraduate and graduate degrees. 
We are so lucky to have these women with us today, both as scholars and as advocates for Mississippi women and their stories, committed to revealing new aspects of this rich and complicated history. Thanks to all of you for joining us as we launch these efforts to encourage and disseminate these important endeavors that enrich our understanding of the world and to provide inspiration and material for future scholars. Good afternoon. Thank you, Amanda, for not reading my whole bio. <laughs> it's so intimidating when you're up against yourself. So, but thank you, Amanda, and I get to do a lot of great work together with the Humanities Council. And so I was thrilled that she thought enough of me to invite me to this inaugural address. I had no idea it was inaugural <laughs> until Amanda told me. I think she waited until last week to, to sort of reveal that little detail. But Dr. Swain, thank you for being here. Thank you for your very important work. And despite not being a historian, uh, thank you for allowing me to kick off your series. So uh, no pressure, but yeah, I will do my best. Uh, this is a beautiful campus. I'm honored to join you all today. And so to demonstrate uh, how honored I feel, I will not hold the tears, but I will try to engage you in what I've been thinking about in terms of Eudora Welty's legacy and thinking about Eudora Welty in the 21st century, which I think demands a different type of scholar. I think it demands a different type of lens. And so I'm just gonna sort of introduce you into some of the work that I've been doing and thinking about in terms of Eudora Welty. I'm a native Jacksonian. I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and I discovered Ms. Welty's work when I was 12 years old. And I heard why I live at the PO. I heard her read it, her recording of it, which you read the story, but you haven't heard her read the story. You haven't read the story. <laughs> There's something about her sort of deep, uh, rich tone that adds, brings life to that story. But at that time in my seventh grade in language arts classroom, I fell in love with this writer who was able to characterize people and family in a way that allowed for me as a little black girl from Jackson, Mississippi to connect to an experience that was obviously very disparate from mine. And I wanted to know how to write like that. And I wanted to understand what motivated a writer like that to produce such work. And so uh, that's been almost 30 years ago. And I'm still thinking about and writing about Eudora Welty. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about the chapter in this new book, and I'm told the press has some copies. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, this Boom. <laughs> so this is a shameless plug now. But, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about this chapter, which I'm very proud. It's my newest sort of contribution to the discussion or discourse on wealthy. And um, I will be very forthcoming and honest in sharing that it's about the demonstrators, a 1966 story that she wrote. And I write about specifically the black characters in that story. And I struggled with these characters. They talked to me, they woke me up at night. Uh, they forced me to stop writing and take a nap because I wasn't in the right place to write about them more than I was writing about Wealthy uh, because that's sort of what Wealthy did. So I wanna talk to you about how I came to this process and this thinking. Each time I broached the subject of Eudora Welty's treatment and consideration of race in her writing and photography, I hear the words of the incomparable Toni Morrison describing Welty as a fearless writer who wrote about Black people in a way that few white writers have ever been able to write, not patronizing, not romanticizing, but the way they should be written about. Considering the tremendous loss to the literary community, and the world at large of Toni Morrison just last year, I thought her words about wealthy and race would be an appropriate opening to my chat with you today. Morrison's perspective on wealthy has many times given me the courage to continue to examine the treatment of race in wealthy's work. As a Black scholar, I've been questioned and criticized for focusing so consistently on a white 20th century writer who some feel created thin inequitable Black characters in her fiction or wrote about Black people inequitably. Welty's 1966 short story, The Demonstrators, was my first introduction to the complexity of Black characters in the author's writing. And on the surface, 
it is quite easy to view this story as one that possesses Black characters who lack full characterization in comparison to the story's white characters. However, to grasp the depth of the Black characters in Welton's fiction and their proximity to the real Black people who existed in the world that Welty inhabited, we must resist the tendency to see them as marginal. So I'm going to break away from those comments and actually go to my chapter and, and read a little bit. No spoiler alert, so still buy the book. <laughs> but a little bit of kind of what I was thinking in terms of this argument. Welty living in the Jim Crow South inhabited a socially enforced and culturally specific distance from Black people. This is a fact that she admitted to many times. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I resist the insinuation that Black people and bodies in her text are not presented with profound understanding. Their humanity and their realities are shown with different details from their white counterparts, but they are not alien or animal. Readers must suspend the interpretive tools they are accustomed to employing to recognize that life can be lived and expressed on and from the margins, even in texts. Welty's awareness of her own intersections and positionality is clear in her fiction, as well as in statements that she made throughout her life. She knew she could not emphasize, or empathize rather, with the Black experience of the mid-century American South. She admitted as much, and perhaps this did very much guide her production of Black characters. However, these characters, based on her observation of real people, are not impossible to interpret. When Welty published The Demonstrators in 1966, America's social climate was charged with racial tension mirrored by contemporary issues that we experience today. Welty's official biographer, Susan Mar Suzanne Mars, notes that as Welty was coping with personal tragedies at this point in her life, she lost her mother, she had lost both of her brothers and her father earlier on in her life. She was also deeply concerned with the unsettled nature of race relations in Mississippi and the South at large. According to Mars, what sparked the story, and that's the demonstrators, was an amalgam of Welty's emotions, including frustration with the ingrained racism that dominated Mississippi, frustration with the tensions that often overwhelmed daily life in the 60s, relief that needed change was finally coming about, regret that reasoned discussion had been replaced by loud, violent confrontations. This work, the demonstrators and others like it, existed as a reflection of society at the time that it happened, and that's Ms. Welch's words. This admission of reflecting what happened attests to the inclusion of real people and observations in the demonstrators. And if this is the case, the Black characters, no matter how different and limited they may seem to the casual observer, are true, interpretable, and not inscrutable at all. So personally, I'm less concerned with Welty's intentionality and more concerned with the Black lives she represented. Dr. Strickland is the primary white character in The Demonstrators. And I find that his limitations mirror Welty's limit limitations in understanding this community of Black people that she creates in this short story. Yet she immerses herself in their experience anyway. My interest is in particular in this text is a manner in which it demonstrates elements of Black life that allow for an equitable consideration of the Black community beyond what Welty may have even realized herself. Welty steps aside to allow these characters to represent themselves and instead of speaking for them through a lens of cultural understanding, they speak for themselves. I believe it's our reading of these characters that must be deep and rich, as opposed to demanding characters that are on an equal playing field to characters of a different cultural identity. That allow them, our deep readings allow them, as Morrison might put it, Toni Morrison, to move at the margin, to represent from the marginalia. Regardless of the rendering of a character, there's still something to be seen, something to be known, from their very presence in the text at all. Thus, it does not matter whether or not Welty crafted black characters that parallel their white counterparts. We do not need to know the whole 
of a character's world or even hear their voices for them to possess authenticity. Characters do not always need to speak to tell a story. What I find authentic about Welty is her thoughtful handling of this community outside of her own. Considering her social distance from Black people and communities, this distance that is facilitated by the sordid racial realities of the place she called home, Jackson, Mississippi. It would have been, I feel, disingenuous and insulting even if she had attempted to represent Black lives through her characters <laughs> other than she did. A variety of expressions, I believe, possess the ability to demonstrate life. I'll take it, I'll go back to the text and I'd like to talk about some of the characters and the demonstrators and kind of what Welty uh, is doing and what we should be doing as readers. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I've got little people at home, so <laughs> I'm used to yelling and blow out an address. And looking for the Black characters to resemble their white counterparts, we limit the richness of what is being communicated through silences, voids, and gaps. This is not an issue of vantage point, but rather of allowing a variety of expressions to demonstrate life in our minds. Welty professed to be reflecting what she had witnessed in her hometown of Jackson, Mississippi, during the civil rights era in the demonstrators and other stories. Understanding the historicity of that Southern space and time period calls forth images of linked racial injustice and social unrest. Welty's work allows the reader to witness communities as she had seen them, with all the implications of racial and social gaze. When asked by Alice Walker if the Black people she met throughout her life ever crept into her fiction, Welty responded, what I put into a short story in the form of characters might be called certain qualities of people in certain situations. No, pin it down more, some quality that makes them unique. I try to dramatize something like this in a way that can show it better than life shows it. In that quote, Welty acknowledges that while she attempts to record and reflect, she also works to pinpoint the distinctive elements of the communities she narrates, all for the purpose of demonstrating life more efficiently than life does itself. Welty's characters, whether major or on the periphery, matter more to her fiction than do her personal views on race. Their utter presence illustrates a level of tenacity. Their lives force themselves into the text like the demonstrators. Despite Welty's public denial of the story as a piece that champions equal rights, the text unearths elements of Black life, such as signifying, capital S, through language and performance. These are elements with which LT, Welty rather, would have had very little familiarity, if any at all, if it were not for her observation. These elements are demonstrations of real lives and real people that supersede the author's best intention. And so I, I go on to talk about this concept of signifying. When I first read the demonstrators, I was struck because there was so much that I found myself familiar with, with my intimacy from coming from a Southern Black community. And so that begged the question, what could Welty have understood, especially as she admits, I could have only known Black women in the atmosphere of the home. I could have only known Black people in the 1940s and 50s and 60s when she was writing the most with these sort of, sort of social barriers that existed. And one thing I appreciate about those comments is that they're authentic, they're truthful. She doesn't profess to say, of course, I knew what Black people were feeling during this time period that was so tumultuous as it relates to race. But she says, this is how I was able to view them. And they find their ways into stories like the demonstrators, almost exactly like she talks about them in her biography, like she talks about them in her nonfiction, as they surface in her photography, you see these people become fictional characters in her short stories. So in the demonstrators, we have a, a sort of main speaking character who in 
Welty's autobiography, she met in Meridian at the train station. A woman she never really spoke to, but she observed every time she was traveling through that train station. And then this woman becomes a character in her text. And while the woman has more lines, perhaps in the fictional short story than she ever did with Welty at that Meridian train station, Welty doesn't add to this woman's characterization more than she could have known. And so for me, as a Black reader of her writing, I saw these authentic traits that reminded me of women I knew, women I loved, women I had experienced, and perhaps the woman I was growing to be. And so this, this notion of signifying, this, this trait of language that is distinct to the African-American community, uh, we call it a derivative of double talk. So it is resting control in a situation or in an environment where you possess no social control at all, like 1966 Mississippi. And in the presence of this white doctor, and he's a medical doctor, Dr. Strickland, we have this undereducated, low, low socioeconomic black environment, black community communicating and resting power in the presence of one of the community's sort of uh, central figures, Dr. Strickland, through signifying. And so there's ironic humor in signifying. It's me sending a message through intonation, through laughter, through winking, through clapping, through noises, and even through sort of inside jokes to other members of my community. And Dr. Strickland is none the wiser. And what Welty does there that I think is brilliant is we've got Dr. Strickland, who is the only doctor in the town. And I mean, that still exists for a lot of our, our towns today in Mississippi, but you can imagine the kind of social capital that gave him in 1966. And so he is he's an important figure in Holden, in Holden, which is the fictional community, but in that black household, as he's examining this black woman, as he becomes this victim of signifying. He doesn't get the jokes. He doesn't get the answers. He doesn't understand while they're laughing and there's someone who has been stabbed right there on the table, but they're sending messages back and forth and they are disallowing him to take social control of that environment. And so while Welty might have been able to cue in on being in a situation like that herself, during the 1930s and 40s, she was a photographer for the Works Progress Administration. And so she went into a lot of poor communities and many of those communities or black communities. And she asked permission to take pictures of various things and people. But I imagine in that role, she might have been the butt of the joke sometimes, or not, or she might have not have been included in on the joke or the conversation or the communication. And so as she was observing how she might have been treated and positioned in that environment, we find that in texts like The Demonstrators. And it's remarkable because she relinquishes her power in writing the story to these characters who speak to her through her experience. At least that's my argument. And so there's a similarity between Welty and Dr. Strickland. Now, Dr. Strickland is completely frustrated because he's used to being powerful in this town, in his white maleness, and in his professional career. He is at the top of this proverbial totem pole in this work, but this community doesn't allow him to have power in their home, in their neighborhood. And so what was remarkable to me when I read this story is I said, they're signifying. They're signifying, they're talking to each other. They're not answering his questions. They, he's asking them for information and they're laughing. They're leaving out details. That is signifying. So that's something that I argue that Welty would not have been keen on because this is a West African derivative of devil talk that's associated with a West African urban deity, Esua Ledbar, and the signifying monkey. She would not have been introduced to that in 1966, but it finds its way into the story anyway. And what that communicates to me as an observer of how well she moved and wrote is that she pinned this community down the, the exact way she received it. And so the truth of their experience found its way onto the pages of the demonstrators, whether or not that was Welty's 
full intention or something that she was aware of. And I think that's what Morrison was relating to when she calls her a fearless writer. Because a writer that was fearful of what a community might say or what her community might say might have switched things up a bit. Not made Dr. Strickland look like the fool that he looks like when he leaves that little ramshackle home. But she does. And it made me wonder, maybe Welty left some of these communities feeling foolish, without information, feeling unwelcome in a sense, because there's everything wasn't for her in that environment. And so I respect her, uh, including someone like Dr. Strickland in the story. And I'll read a little bit about sort of what I say about signifying and perhaps about Dr. Strickland. Let's start with Dr. Strickland, guy you love to hate. <laughs> and how many folks have read the demonstrators? It's okay, it's not class, there was no pop quiz. <laughs> Great, I saw lots of hands pop up. But in this story, Dr. Strickland, uh, again, the only physician in the town, he's white and male, and a young black woman has been stabbed, presumably by her lover, her name is Ruby. And so uh, a little black child is sent to get Dr. Strickland to examine Ruby and her stab wound in the home. And he comes back to the house. The room, is, the room is silent in response to Dr. Strickland's civilian investigation into the altercation that caused Ruby's injury. Strickland believes his white privilege and elevated social status afford him the right to know the details of the evening and the crime. What's interesting there is that he's a medical doctor. It's none of his business. And that community who is less educated, less privileged, protects Ruby, protects Dove, who is the alleged, uh, you know, assailant and lover. You don't get to know our business. You just get to treat our community member. The community feels different and resists. Throughout his condescending interrogation, the unidentified Black speakers utter non-distinct responses. You write this time. Oh, you got it right this time. Pointing to his inaccuracy in attempting to understand the dynamics of their experience. While the events of the evening are unclear due to the evasive replies of Ruby's family, neighbors, and friends, what is clear is that people in Ruby's room the rest of the house and the yard are keenly aware of the circumstances, yet unwilling to allow those details to be revealed to an outsider who refuses to acknowledge their humanity. They wrest social power from Dr. Strickland, who is, according to Susan Harian, Harrison, rather, accustomed to wielding authority over their bodies, both black and white. And so in that moment, we see this entire community because a small town, something happens, everybody's going to the house. And they all seem to know what has transpired that evening. It happens at a community event. But Dr. Strickland, throughout his uh, examination of Ruby's body, never gets the story. And so as the reader, we never get the story. And in 1966, we can imagine who Eudora Welty's readership was. It wasn't a lot of folks who would have represented this Black community in Holden. And so just as the story was withheld from Dr. Strickland, the story is withheld from wealthy who imagines it, who imagines these characters, and it's withheld from us as the reader. We don't get to usurp this community's power. We don't get to uh, involve ourselves in what is sacred to them, which is their autonomy at this point. And to say that wealthy indicts Dr. Strickland is also to say that she understands him from her own experience of whiteness. Dr. Strickland's cognizance of the items surrounding him in Ruby's home further distance him from the Black community and link him to Welty's own curious witness of Black people she may have met, especially during her stint with the WPA in the 1930s and early 40s. And so we see uh, Strickland in this very literally dark room. They don't turn on much light. There are little uh, gerbils running around that he wants them to catch and they don't do that uh, for him because this isn't your space to feel comfortable. You're here to do a job. And he becomes frustrated with the lack of information that he received because he feels that he's owed it because of his social status. 
one of the most interesting points that brought this story to my attention was the way that the West African cousin of signifying Asua Legbara leaves characters feeling tricked. And so in those narratives, those West African narratives and that lore, Asua Legbara frustrates folks who have more social power than him. And they leave his pre presence feeling completely disempowered and angry. And so we see in this story, for those of you who have read it, Dr. Strickland leaves this home completely outdone, frustrated, not knowing what happened and not truly being able to treat Ruby because of it. Another interesting point in the story is that when he enters the house, there are all of these uh, Black citizens of Holden who know exactly who he is, but he doesn't recognize them. Despite one woman having worked for his mother his entire life, uh, some of his mother's clothing is hanging on the clothing line, having been passed down to folks who worked uh, in their home. But in that scenario, he doesn't recognize these people that he is supposed to have known from treating them, from being around town, or literally have been, have, having been raised by one of the women in the room, who, when you read the story, she's the most powerful. She resists his questions. She directs his gaze. She forces him to do his job and ultimately leave. And that's the woman that sort of mirrors this woman that a wealthy encountered in Meridian serving coffee at the train station. This woman who had a power, had an autonomy, had an agency, despite living in a debased social condition in 1966, Mississippi. Beyond that, Welty's keen eye for observation of what existed around her allowed her to witness many things as they existed. Among those things were Black people living their lives, demonstrating their realities, so the characters she created out of these observations do not belong to her. They are self-possessed representations of real souls. They, the form they take on in the story <coughs> does not make them any less so. And stories like The Demonstrators, Livy, A Worn Path, and Powerhouse, and nonfiction writings like Pageant of Birds, Cindy and the Joyful Noise, and Ida M. Toy, we can locate acts of resistance from Black communities plagued by racial oppression, even though that was not Welty's intention. Because those characters are a reflection of Welty's witnessing of real people, Welty spoke of her writing process as one in which the characters spoke to her. They motivated the story. And I spoke a little bit about how these demonstrators' characters motivated my writing, and they wouldn't let me veer towards what Welty was doing, but more what they were doing to Welty and how they made it onto the page. Welty was not immune to racism or racialized thought, and I think we have to be honest and clear about that. However, that did not hinder real communities of Black people from penetrating her mind and making their way onto pages of her fiction and nonfiction. While it could be argued that her interest or fascination with their lives may have existed as a patronizing gaze, that did not endow her with the power to strip away their truth. Through her depiction of the community she observed as an outsider, Welty allows the personas she created uh, to achieve agency and speak for themselves and show forth truer characterizations of their lives. Critics who look for Welty to wave a, a banner of justice against racial injustice risk missing the messages that are larger than the author herself. And again, in that, I'm saying that uh, sometimes I believe we give too much power to authors. We want them to achieve something for us that we are not willing to dig for ourselves. And Welty just doesn't let us do that. Welty's narratives use free indirect discourse in which, as Sarah Ford explains, the narrator tells the story but takes on the character's opinions, thought, and language. And here, the story's narrator, although separate from Dr. Strickland, reflects his objectification rather, of the Black citizens of Holden by the white community. The narration, flavored with the perception of that character, objectifies the Black character's bodies, describing Ruby's nipples as casting shadows that look like figs 
and her infant son's fingernails as gray as the claw of a squirrel. Racial partition is made clear even earlier in the story when Dr. Strickland is summoned to attend to Ruby by a Negro child, and that's Negro child in quotation. With that brief mention, Welty demonstrates the separation between Holden's white community, represented by Dr. Strickland, and the child designated as Negro, not simply a child, a Jim Crow point of view. And so that's what I mean when Welty incorporates, absolutely incorporates sort of racialized thoughts and being affected by being socialized in a hyper-racialized society. I think we do her work a disservice to say that she had this complete and profound understanding uh, that wasn't colored by the social condition. I think we lose the message and we wrest from these characters the power that they wrestled from their writer and being represented exactly the way uh, that they existed in her story. I'll end by saying that uh, I have struggled with this story, The Demonstrators, even in the title. Because we don't give a, get a clear depiction of who's demonstrating what. And that's sort of how I came to the title of my article. It's the demonstration of life. And in this story that could be salacious, we could be distracted by what Ruby and Dove were fighting about, why Ruby is wearing sort of a beauty pageant sash and a satin dress in the bed, where they were, why they won't answer Dr. Strickland's questions. We could completely overlook what they are demonstrating uh, underneath the surface, which is this sophisticated mode of communication, this desire to rest and maintain power, especially in a home that belonged to them and their community and to protect their bodies and their lives in the presence of this dominating uh, white gaze that was supposed to save but Dr. Strickland is more interested in the gossip of the story than he is with Ruby's body. So I think there's a lot more going on there than there is with this salacious plot. And uh, Welty challenges us by presenting this story, giving that sort of cryptic title and allowing us to have this sort of participatory experience with a story like The Demonstrators in 1966, uh, when we can argue that the movement for civil rights, especially as it relates to race, was at its height. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm told some people have five o'clock class, <laughs> which is awesome. I could never take evening classes. Uh, but I'm told there's time for questions that I'm happy to answer. Yes, sir. I'm uh, exposed by ignorance about wealthy, but I'm and I really enjoyed the lecture. I think it was important, very informative, and it gave us some new insights and uh, like like relations that others have not given us, and especially from the perspective of wealthy. And I, I feel that wealthy did a pretty good job of creating the black characters in this story. So this this is this is my question is where is wealthy coming from? I remember looking at some of her photographs yeah. and the heavily photographs of African Americans. And uh, and I believe she was from Wisconsin. She wasn't a native Mississippi. She's she went to school here. Oh, she went born she, and raised. <laughs> she she did uh, spend a little time in Wisconsin. She's born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. I knew she went to school here. Yeah, she did. We didn't talk about the last one. Oh, cool. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, but she, she was born and raised in Jackson. Correct. But her parents were. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she didn't bring, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if she did not bring a typical Southern woman's attitude toward African Americans and race in Jackson, Mississippi, because of her, because of her background. And I don't know if I would go as far as, as to say she didn't bring uh, the perspective of a white woman in the mid-century, middle class, arguably, to her stories. How could she have not? That's who she was. I do think that she departed from a lot of uh, her 
social peers, because she was willing to be observant, because she was willing to relinquish social power. And so uh, if you if you read any of her biography or any of, I spent a summer with her correspondence uh, letters that she wrote to her agent, Dermot Russell. And in that, there's so much watching where she's just writing to Dermot Russell about, there's this really fun moment, I have to read it to you now. And you can, you can blame the audience. <laughs> but uh, there's so much watching and documenting of, hey, guess what I saw today? I saw this, I witnessed this. And I think that is part of her character that set her apart from folks who thought they understood and just wrote what they thought was happening, as opposed to seeing something, documenting it, and writing down, including what you documented, as opposed to what you assumed was the case. And so this moment I want to read, I'll be very brief, but uh, this is in a letter to Dermot Russell. And she's talking about being on Ferris Street, which was the Black economic district in Jackson, Mississippi, especially during uh, segregation. It was where Black businesses and doctors and barbershops and restaurants were. And Wealthy spent time there going to some of the blues clubs, eating some of the amazing food. And so she drives down in 1942 the street. It's Fair Street. It's one economic district. And she writes to Dermot Russell. We drove through the color section where all the clothes are the most imaginative and really the most effective on shining dark skin. When you get right down to Easter colors, the Negro men this year have a style all their own, not copied from white people, but theirs, and it is a delight. Pants come up as high as the points of the collar, almost, and bell out and come to peg tops, showing six, six inches of sock, right? Shirts are, shirts are satin, coats are long and come as low as the bend in the knee behind and are light, perishable color. Hats are up to 10 or 12 inches wide in the brim, gently turned up like a saucer. Some colored and some black with white satin bands and all have one, two, three full length turkey feathers stuck in the back. This is the back view, but does not tell you how they walk. When they ride bicycles, their coattails float afar, far behind them like gauzy dragonfly wings. As in bird life, the females are far surpassed no matter how hard they try. <laughs> and in that letter, she draws a, there's a sketch of a man from the back view with this wide brim hat and these ballooning pants. And so, what, I mean, and there are moments in there where I'm like, oh, it's not <laughs> <laughs> But she's an observer. And uh, Toni Morrison described her as having a very searching eye. And I think there was something in that qualification that allowed her to pin down people as she saw them. And if you pin down people as you see them, then there's some element of their truth in them that you don't have to understand, but you can document it in other folks who might have the, the legend or the map for that experience will pick up, like I feel I did with signifying in the demonstrators. Of course, I never got to talk to her about it, but she would not have been familiar with this sort of West African derivative of uh, devil talk and a uh, verbal, a meta narrative of trickery, but it's in the story. And that tells me that she was in an environment where this likely happened to her. And so she just writes these characters in the way that they came to her, as they spoke to her, as they motivated the story. And then there's an element of truth, the demonstration of life in that. Yes. Um, I went to college in Mississippi and I graduated in 2004, and that's when I learned about your wealthy. And that's kind of what I fell in love with there. And that's when I read the story Powerhouse. Ah. And I, oh, salacious. I, I, I would read the story of the other person in the art, and I didn't have it in her reading it. Awesome. And then I heard it, and I had the same feeling that you just said that all of this. Ouch, Powerhouse is a doozy. Yeah, the first paragraph is like, yeah. Yeah. it does. <laughs> I agree. Um, so, how do you re reread that today? Even so interestingly, I teach Powerhouse. And uh, when I teach Welty, and of course, I start with Powerhouse, but I don't reveal the identity of the writer. And I teach at an historically Black college. And so they read Powerhouse, and just as with the demonstrators, there's something recognizable there. So I read it, I have students read it in a unit about the blues. And so they read it, but they're listening to Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson, B.B. Um, King. And 
because they've been listening to these black male blues artists, then they read Powerhouse. Well, of course, not only was this not written by a white person, but it could have been a woman. Because <laughs> <laughs> Powerhouse has this salacious moment of infidelity and uh, overt sexuality and uh, just maleness at its most raw <laughs> and toxic masculinity. It's all there in Powerhouse. And so they get to the story, they talk about it, and then I say, hey, this is the person that wrote it, and mouth drop. <laughs> How? What? And, and then I give the history of wealthy spending time on Fair Street in some of these clubs and sort of pinning down the experience. And that first paragraph is deeply offensive. It's this <laughs> white gaze on this black blues artist or jazz artist. And it, I mean, they're allusions to monkeys, yeah. jungle, he just animalistic. Uh, but like Dr. Strickland, she's able to adopt this gaze, this very patronizing, uh, racialized gaze, but we still get an element of truth in that musician's uh, capacity to kind of rise above that. It doesn't matter to Powerhouse how he's being He's being paid in that moment, and there are these deep, uh, gut-wrenching facts that they're not able to eat in the same establishment where they're playing. They have to go down the street to get a beer during the intermission. So those, those, there are those moments of uh, devastating truth, but we still get these characters existing outside of this gaze. It doesn't matter to them the way that they're viewed, because there's a whole other world of happenings, powerhouses. Wife has left him for another man and sends him a telegraph uh, from this supposed man. Hey, I'm dead. You're dead to me. I mean, this is my interpretation. <laughs> juicy, juicy. Um, but there's this whole other world of ha happening in Powerhouse that doesn't care, that is not dependent on him being viewed as the N word, as a monkey, as performing for uh, this white dance crowd who's not even dancing. To his beautiful music, <laughs> they're having a whole conversation that they, while they're playing that has nothing to do with what's going on in that audience. So I think that story, I and mean, there's so many things you could do with that story. And just figuring out who Uranus Knockwood is, <laughs> is enough. But I teach it um, allowing the students to familiarize themselves with the character before the author because of the way that Welty observed. Those characters come from someone's truth and we owe them the dignity of getting to know them in a way that we don't have to know the author and the show back. Yes. Um, when you look at Wealthy Spending Time, the stories that don't have black characters, does she use the same kind of technique, this distancing or this uh, objective observation without trying to guess what they're thinking? Or is there a different style? I think so. And the Morrisonian tendency in me would say, I don't think there is a story that doesn't have a presence of blackness in it uh, because of the setting of the stories. And even if there isn't a pronounced black character, they're there doing something existing because what is the American South without black? Um, but in other identities that she couldn't relate to, I'll use, for example, the whistle which is a story about uh, an impoverished white couple uh, trying to save their tomato crop, which is their livelihood, and keep warm so they burn everything uh, just to stay warm in a fire because there's a, a, an unseasonable frost. Wealthy would not have understood abject poverty. She never lived in it. She would not have understood living in those uh, extreme rural conditions. So I think in characterizing folks like, uh, the people, the characters in The Whistle. She was doing something similar there. These also kind of look like some of the folks she took pictures of during the Depression. And that was not her experience. She did not have to fight for food and economic stability in the way that these families did. Uh, so I think she would have had to distance herself from their experience as well and writing them with, with an authenticity that's not insulting or reductive. So the short answer is, I'm sort of a chicken and egg 
chicken and the egg question for you. Uh -huh. you, use, you know, the words you and gays and business. And, uh, and I think of well being as a part of the question. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, do you think her ability to capture this sort of objective picture and then transmit it on the page is, you know, is it because of her skills as a photographer or the skills as a photographer just another aspect? Excellent question and that well he answers. But we're not always aware of our truth. Yeah. Right? So I think Welty would say that or I think Welty has said that you know she took pictures separately and she wrote and they're not always related, although there are stories and nonfiction pieces that are exactly connected to those pictures. I mean pageant of birds took pictures of the bird pageant and then wrote about it. Uh, but I would, I think, as a writer myself, um, I think it had to have started with her ability to create in the written word, in the way that she uh, framed people and communities. So I'm a writer who also teaches aspect of film analysis, and that's how it works for me. And so that's how I, I understand it after going through her negatives and going through her story and then reading correspondence like this. It seems to always start for Welty with the way that she envisions life and how fascinated she is with the most unremarkable things, right? Like people walking down the street, folks selling vegetables, uh, okra and black eyed peas. She writes a whole letter to Dermot Russell about that. And uh, she, she writes another letter about hiring the cook and being curious about the cook's boyfriend, which she thinks is a warlock. I mean, I don't know if Dermot Russell ever read this book because well, digression, but <laughs> I think it had to have started with her ability to create as a writer. And then maybe even unbeknownst to her, that's how she was framing these people. The photographs are breathtaking. They really are. And they tell stories without words. So I think she was always telling stories. Whether she would ever admit to that or not. I mean, she doesn't admit the demonstrators is a, is a sort of racial justice piece. It is. <laughs> but we're not all, we don't always possess the ability to be aware of our reality. I think it's here and here. And Amanda, keep me. No, oh, I'm just enjoying this so much. Somebody else is going to have to stop it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes. Two more. And then we'll go. Okay, we've got two more. And so I'd like to add that Steve Michelle here made this close analysis of a teenager wealthy when she was in Kansas. Oh. All the stuff she did when she was here, and it tells you a whole lot. That's some. That's a wealthy I don't know much about. And following up on that, I mm -hmm. want to say that when she was here at 15 or 16, for two years, mm -hmm. she was a cartoonist and a humorist. We that have our sense. cartoons that appeared in the school papers. Right. right. here. Right. All of the archives. And They're here in the archives. She was also making sure you see it. She was an actress. Yeah. She, she wrote a play. She saw a humor. Everything, I think, because Sadly. of that's what her tendency as a person is. And the cartoons and the writing are both there when she's 15 or 16. And then she just keeps on going. The photography, I think, kind of follows on with her ability to draw pictures before she had a camera. Yeah. Knowing that now is uh, plausible. And I mean, she was taking pictures because she needed a job. Yeah. Um, they become these pieces of art. And uh, that's a wonderful sort of nugget of um, information. She was very humorous and she had this lovely sarcastic ability that I was really not keen to until I started reading her letters, right? These things that she never thought this graduate student in 2013 would be reading. Just like that, she's 15 years old. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah, so some of us are just born blessed. <laughs> but um, I know when I say us, I do not include myself in that. But reading her notes to friends and her correspondence, these very quick-witted things, you almost become envious of her ability to be so quick-witted, to, to master uh, her, her first language in the way that she did. So she was always communicating. And I'm going to have to check out some of these oh, wow. cartoons because um, I am I'm enamored of her photography and the way that there is strength in poverty. There's no shame in the way that she photographs those communities. We'll also love looking at the humor magazine that they published while they were here. She and her friends had graduated. And that's why she left to go to Wisconsin. 
It is 1920s, hilarious, salacious, yeah, wonderful. She had a nod yes. event, right? If you've ever visited her house, which you're in Jackson, I'd be mm-hmm. happy to show you around. Uh, but there's a little uh, shed in the back of her house that was affectionately known as the House of Passions. <laughs> and she and her friends hung out there. And, you know, who knows what happened. But Salacious was, I mean, well, she was a woman about town when she wanted to be. Last question. So I went to Murrow High School. So did I! <laughs> Mustang! <laughs> no blue. Her house is like a popular Yeah. And I just, I've been a national press since I started writing and writing books. Um, yeah. Why do you think she even cared about my life and how do you think she her? Excellent question. So where is the voice coming from? She wrote it a couple days after Megger Evers is assassinated. And it's in the voice of the assumed assassin. What is, there's so many uncanny moments in that text because she imagined what this assassin was troubled with, what he was thinking, how envious he was. It's Roland Summers in that story, but it's obviously Megger Evers. And there's so, there was so much truth and what she wrote down two days after the assassination, that it affected her being able to publish the story. And she had to take certain things out and change names. And it's Thermopylae, it's not Jackson. Um, and so I think, and it's conjecture on my part, but knowing how troubled she was with the state of affairs in her hometown, in her home state during uh, the 60s, and then that thing coming to a head with the murder of this black man in his driveway while his wife and children are inside and he's holding t-shirts. I think it just bubbled over for her in a way that she communicates all of that heat in the story. It's very hot in that story. It's summer when Mayor Evers is killed. It's summer when Roland Summers, Summers, she uses Mm -hmm. the term summer for his name uh, in that story. And so I think it was a deep frustration knowing that she couldn't actively do much that would matter but she could write. And if she could write and help to kind of help us to glean some, whoever would read it, glean some understanding of what goes on inside the head of someone who could perpetuate that type of evil. And what we find out is this deep trauma that this assassin is struggling from. And it's so close to what actually happened. Yeah. So she's able to imagine this mindset because she's seen it. She's perhaps been in rooms where folks are having deeply offensive conversation or feel that they can say certain things to her because her skin is white and why would you care? And so she, that sort of frustration, I think, first, let me pin it down and either show you yourself or show others who you are. And it's a, a deeply alarmingly relevant story today in terms of how disenfranchised uh, some working class white communities in Mississippi feel and that frustration being projected onto communities that have no power to change their condition, right? So that assassin is angry with Roland Summers and his wife for having a green manicured lawn and having their own home and having a car and him always being on television. And he's upset about his socioeconomic condition as a poor white man. And his wife is absolutely true, right? She tells you're an idiot. All you're going to do is get his face on TV more now that you killed him. And by the way, you forgot your gun. (laughs) He leaves it at the murder site. And so I think it's just this complex, sophisticated, alarmingly relevant, currently relevant story where this community is frustrated, projecting it onto that community. And what ensues is this hot explosion of hatred and evil and death in many manifestations. So that again, conjecture on my part, but that's another story that I teach in the same class as Powerhouse at opposite ends of the semester. Thank you Thank so you. much.